I'm sharing my health journey with you and the mistakes that I made so that you don't fall into the same traps. And there are some twists and turns here because just as I fixed one problem, another problem would rear its head. And I finally reached a point where I'm finished playing whack-a-mole and I'm finally happy with my numbers. So the story begins when I was in second year medical school in 2011. So at this point, we were being taught how to measure our blood pressures. So when my blood pressure was measured, it was about 140. And at that stage, 140 was felt to be okay, particularly since I was only 19 at the time. But the trouble is... 140 we now know is not okay, particularly for someone who's young. Now at this point, it could be explained that maybe my blood pressure is a bit higher because I'm a bit nervous around my colleagues, we're still trying to learn things, it could be a potentially stressful environment. So even though the blood pressure should be below 120, 140 in that environment is maybe okay. And I was led into a false sense of security that my blood pressure was actually going to be okay because I needed to have a procedure done in 2013. And when they checked my blood pressure, it was 120. And I thought, that's all okay. Now, at that point, I had some midazolam on board, which is a relaxant, basically. It's like having a few pints of beer. So obviously, my blood pressure was going to be quite low because I was lying down and I was all nicely relaxed because I had these other drugs on board. And again, I was led into a false sense of security. Now, the background to all of this is that in my family, we do have high blood pressure. So even though I've got family members who are fit, they're thin, they've still got blood pressure around 140 and 150, and they need to be on medications. There's nothing else that they can optimize. So I knew that there was the potential that my blood pressure could be at that 140 or 150 level because I may have had inherited those genes. But again, I thought that since my blood pressure was measured at 120, I would be absolutely fine. But at the clinic, I'm always recommending to my patients to measure their blood pressure at home. And that's the advice that I give here on YouTube. So I thought, you know what? I need to actually follow my own advice. I need to buy an at-home blood pressure monitor and actually see what my blood pressure is and make sure that it truly is at 120 and not at that 140 to 150 level. And I was horrified when I was measuring my blood pressure. So consistently, I was getting measurements at about 140 to 150. And again, I'm fit. I exercise regularly. I have a great diet with lots of potassium in it. I've got low sodium. There's nothing else... In my lifestyle that I can optimize to lower my blood pressure. And I was pretty disappointed with myself at this stage because, again, all of the advice that I give to my patients is to check their blood pressure at home, and that's the advice that I give here on YouTube. So I'm glad that I finally followed my own advice, but I should have done it a heck of a lot earlier. So I want to take you through the journey about how I've managed to get my blood pressure down to 120, and by doing that, I created some other problems that I then needed to fix. So I'm going to show you the patient portal. This is the portal that we use to actually have a look at our blood test results. So one of the things that we're looking at when we're assessing high blood pressure is, is there anything underlying that's causing the blood pressure to go up in the first place? So one of the things that we look at is the aldosterone renin group. So that's just having a look to make sure that there's, again, nothing untoward that's causing my blood pressure to go up and we need to treat that root cause. So here we can see that my blood results are absolutely fine. It's the same with my thyroid. So if in overactive thyroid patients, if your thyroid levels are too high, that can actually cause your blood pressure to go up. But again, we can see that my uh, thyroid levels are fine. Another thing that we're looking at is called plasma metanephrines. Uh, again, that's absolutely fine. Now, one of the other things that we can that we could potentially have considered here is what my cortisol levels are. So there's a thing called Cushing's disease, and that's basically where if your body is producing too much cortisol, uh, patients present with high blood pressure, uh, they present being overweight, and they have this moon face appearance. And it's typically caused because of, say, adrenal tumors, uh, pituitary gland disorders, but again, I didn't have any other symptoms aside from a high blood pressure. So there was no point in testing uh, my cortisol levels. But if I was going to test my cortisol levels as a general screening test, what I would have done is a saliva test in the middle of the night because at night, your cortisol levels should be right down low. Uh, so if you test your saliva levels for cortisol and the cortisol levels are too high and you've got some of those symptoms of Cushing's disease, as in too much uh, cholesterol in the blood, then you may have Cushing's disease and that needs to be treated because that might be the reason as to why you've got high blood pressure but again I don't have that problem and then finally one of the other things that we check is has there been any damage to my kidneys so are my kidneys leaking any protein because if your kidneys are under pressure because of that high blood pressure uh, they can start to leak protein but we can see here that my protein levels in my urine is absolutely fine so I'm not too worried about my kidneys but again over time if I don't treat my high blood pressure then yes I will start to see problems in my kidneys so at this point, I've measured my blood pressure at home over and over again. I know that my blood pressure sits between 140 to 150, and that's just how my genes 
are made, there's nothing else that I can do. It's similar to people who have got familial hypercholesterolemia. So these are people where their livers simply produce too much cholesterol and they can have the very best diet and exercise possible, but their blood lipid panel will still be out of the normal range. And for those patients, we need to um, consider medications. So it's the same thing here with me for blood pressure. There's nothing else lifestyle-wise that I can do to lower my blood pressure to get it to that 120 level. So I have to consider medications. So the first medication that I went on to is candesartan. So I'm just going to let, there you go. Uh, so you'll see here that that's 16 milligrams. Now I started off at eight milligrams, uh, which is a one quarter dose. So candesartan, it works on the kidneys to lower your blood pressure. And uh, eight milligrams is about a one quarter dose. So unfortunately that wasn't enough to get my blood pressure to that 120 level. Uh, so I went from about 145 to say 135 uh, at that eight milligram dose. And so then we decided to increase the dose uh, to a half strength, so to 16 milligrams. So I'll just let that come into focus. There you go. Um, but again, that still wasn't enough. So at this stage, I was about 130. And yes, that, that could be okay, but I'm only 33. I wanted my blood pressure to reach uh, 120. So at this stage, I'm at a half strength dose of candesartan. But there's a trend now to, in medicine that we don't just want to rely on one medication because if you continue to jack up the dose of one pill, you do, there's not added, there's not that much added advantage and you do increase the chances of side effects. So what's better in terms of blood pressure management and also for cholesterol levels is to use lower doses of medications, but use multiple medications because that way, say with blood pressure, I'm going to be attacking my blood pressure at multiple different points. Uh, and that way I can get an overall greater uh, blood pressure lowering effect with less chance of side effects. So I didn't just want to continue to increase the dose of candesartan. I wanted to go for another medication. But then, which medication should I next go on? So, for most patients that I see in the clinic, if we start um, a medication such as candesartan, so that's an ARB uh, class of medication, so that's an angiotensin receptor blocker. Again, it works on the kidneys. So, typically, what I would do for patients that I see in the clinic is that I would start a calcium channel blocker. So, a calcium channel blocker, it relaxes the muscles around the blood vessels and it opens them up. So, if we open up the blood vessels, we reduce the pressure in it. And again, I like to use that medication because it's a completely separate pathway compared to the angiotensin receptor blocker. Again, that's the candesartan that I'm on. But I also know that empagliflozin, that's a medication class um, of SGLT2. Now, this is a really interesting class of medication because in mice from the interventions testing program, that seems to extend male lifespan by about 10%. So that's going on in the back of my mind that I know that there is that medication that's potentially got the uh, chance to increase male lifespan. But the second thing is that we know that this medication uh, so it works by telling the kidneys to pee out sugar. So it's really good to lower your um, your blood sugar levels. It reduces the peaks uh, in your blood sugar levels after a meal. Um, and it, it's a medication that I routinely prescribe to my type 2 diabetic patients. And since it's a diuretic, again, it, it tells your kidneys to pee out sugar. So, so you're, you're peeing a bit more. You reduce your overall blood volume and that can reduce your blood pressure. So it does have a small blood pressure lowering effect. So it's got that blood pressure lowering effect, which is what I want. It lowers um, my blood sugar levels as well, and it's got a little bit of a weight loss effect. There's mice lifespan to su uh, mice lifespan data to suggest that yes, it may increase uh, male lifespan. And it's now being used in more and more patients that are not type 2 diabetics. So for patients that have got chronic kidney disease, for example, SGLT2 inhibitors, that's a class of medication that your doctor might consider putting you on. Uh, it's the same for heart failure patients. So you don't have to have type 2 diabetes to go on to this class of medication, but it's very unusual to use it solely um, as a blood pressure medication. So my GP wasn't exactly comfortable in prescribing that. And to be honest, if, if I saw a patient in, in the clinic that wanted to solely use an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, to lower their blood pressure, I probably wouldn't prescribe it either without the sign off um, of a specialist. So my GP got me to see a kidney specialist just to make sure that they were all okay with me uh, going on to empagliflozin, again, the SGLT2 inhibitor that I wanted to go on um, at a 12 and a half milligram dose to make sure that they were okay with me, <laughs> with me doing that. And luckily for me, the specialist that I saw was okay in signing that off. So here's the medication that I'm on. So it's called, so the brand name is called Giardiance. There you go. Uh, impact of flows. Now you notice that it's a 25 milligram tablet and there's a reason why I did that. Um, so the, the typical dose for non-diabetics, if you need to use this uh, impact of flows in, 
uh, you typically use 10 milligrams, but it's relatively expensive to do that. So if you use the, if you get the um, 25 milligram tablet and you cut it in half, it's a lot cheaper. So I cut these medication, uh, these pills in half uh, so that I'm getting 12 and a half milligrams, which is roughly the 10 milligram dose that I want. And after using candesartan and empagliflozin, my blood pressure reached 120. Um, and again, None of these medications are a replacement for a great diet and regular exercise, so I'm still doing those, but I, my body, just because of my genetic makeup, I needed extra help to reach that uh, blood pressure target of 120. But here's the problem that it introduce, introduces. So empagliflozin, one, uh, one of the effects of it is that it actually starts to raise uh, your LDL cholesterol levels, which is ideally not what we want. Um, so I just wanted to run you through the, the problems that I encountered and the medication changes that I needed to make uh, for my cholesterol levels to reach the targets that I wanted. So before going on to any medications, uh, I had a blood test done on the 24th of January 2023, and we can see that my LDL cholesterol is 1.9 millimoles per litre. So if we convert that uh, into American units, uh, it's 73, which is, it's not bad, that's pretty good, but from the piece of study results, uh, so this was a study that was done in people that had otherwise perfect uh, health in terms of their metabolic health. So, um, you know, they had, th they were a normal weight, they had normal blood pressure, um, they had, th they were insulin sensitive. So that the only, uh, variable here is the LDL cholesterol levels. And they were, they wanted to see what happens in terms of, um, plaque development in blood vessels. And what we can see is that, uh, when the LDL cholesterol is around 50 to 60, there was no plaque development in blood vessels. And so I use that as a justification for me personally to aim for lower LDL cholesterol levels. So my, again, most people would accept uh, LDL cholesterol of 1.9 in, um, in the units that I use here in New Zealand or 73 uh, in the US. But I wanted to get around sort of that 50 to 60 uh, level. So again, there was nothing else that I could do lifestyle wise to lower my LDL cholesterol further. So I really had a great diet in terms of lots of fiber, mineral, minimal saturated fat. So I needed that extra help. So I initially went on to resuvastatin five milligrams. Now that was all fine uh, because when I went and rechecked my blood test results, I was really happy. So I got them rechecked on the 22nd of September, 2023. Uh, and they'd come down to 1.6, which isn't quite the number that I'm after. I want it around 1.4. So I gave it a bit more time and I retested on the 22nd of March, 2024. And we can see that I'd hit my target of 1.4. So at this stage, I was really happy. But this is around the time that I needed to go on to empagliflozin. And that's where my LDL cholesterol went slightly up. So here's the result. It went up to 1.5. Now, again, most people would accept that, but I wanted it below 1.4. And much like the blood pressure uh, discussion, I didn't just want to continue to jack up the dose of the statin medication that I was on. Generally now, it's better to use multiple medications. So I wanted to use, I wanted to add in a medication called azetamibe. Where are we? There we go. Azetamibe. So Azetamibe works by telling the gut to not absorb as much cholesterol. So the statin medication that I was on, it tells the liver to not produce as much cholesterol, whereas the azetamibe works by telling the gut to not absorb as much cholesterol. Um, so together, they work really well to lower the overall blood cholesterol levels. And again, it, it's better to do it. Um, it. It's better to use this strategy using multiple medications to lower the LDL cholesterol because there's less chance of side effects and you get an overall greater lowering effect. So that's why I wanted to add in the azetamibe. And so after being on azetamibe for a few months, I retested my LDL cholesterol and it had dropped to 0.9. So yes, I had reached my LDL cholesterol targets, but then that begs the question, do I need to be on such a potent statin? So resuvastatin is a very potent statin. You only need very small doses of it to get the effect that you want. So I just want to show you this comparison table, which is what I use to explain uh, the different statins to my patients in the clinic. So if we have a look at resuvastatin uh, at the five milligram dose, it's a medium uh, potency at that dose. And it roughly lowers your LDL cholesterol by about 41%, which is roughly what I saw. Um, but there is a problem with resuvastatin. So statins as a class of medication, they can increase the risk of developing high blood sugar levels and insulin resistance, which can eventually lead to the development of type 2 diabetes. But there is an important point here. So even though there is this risk, for type 2 diabetic patients, the benefits of statins still vastly outweigh the risks. So even for type 2 diabetics, one of the first medications that will put them on is a statin medication because what we're trying to do with statin medications is lower the risk 
um, of heart disease in the future. But pravastatin, which is the lowest potency statin, that's associated with the lowest risk of developing new onset diabetes, uh, whereas rosuvastatin, which is the highest potency statin, has the highest risk. So I knew that my LDL cholesterol levels were 0.4. So I had room to switch to pravastatin, which is not as potent. And also pravastatin, it's got a shorter half-life. Basically, that just means that pravastatin only works for a short amount of time. Now, most of the cholesterol that the liver produces is at night. So I was already taking rosuvastatin at night. So if I switched to pravastatin, again, it it only works uh, for a shorter amount of time. So you want to take it at night. It doesn't really work if you take it in the morning. So if I take the pravastatin at night, which is a lower potency statin, uh, it's only working at the time that it really needs to, which is again overnight. And there's potentially less of a side effect in terms of my blood sugar levels. So that's why I wanted to switch from rosuvastatin, which is still a very good medication, to pravastatin because I didn't need such a potent uh, statin to reach my LDL cholesterol targets. And the dose that I'm taking with pravastatin is 20 milligrams. So that's the lower dose. It goes all the way up to 40 milligrams. Uh, but again, I'm hoping that all I'll need is the 20 milligram dose. Now, I haven't rechecked my um, LDL cholesterol levels yet. I'll do that probably in about three months time. But I hope that that gives you a bit of a story uh, in terms of how I've managed to achieve my blood pressure targets of 120 and getting my LDL cholesterol level targets uh, around what well, below that 1.4 level mark or below that sort of 50 to 60 uh, milligrams per deciliter target uh, as per the piece of study results. And again, I wanted to share this because this is me using medications to reach the targets that I want. None of it is going to be a replacement for a great diet and regular exercise. So I hope that you can potentially use some of these learnings and use my journey uh, you, you know, as food for thought in terms of what you're going to do with your own health. Uh, because for most of my patients that I see at the clinic, for most of them, we do want to reach that target Uh, with blood pressure of 120, and we try and get their LDL cholesterol levels below 1.4 in New Zealand units, uh, or below sort of 50 to 60 uh, in US units. So let me know what you think of this video, and let me know if you need to rely on any medications to help you reach your targets despite a great diet and regular exercise.